Hello, you're listening to Conversing the Classics. In the first century AD, the historian Josephus wrote The Jewish War, the most significant text recounting the Roman War in Judea and the Jews in the Roman world. Joining me today to discuss Josephus's work and Judaism in the Roman world is Jonathan Davies, a PhD student in Wolfson College at the University of Oxford. John, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So to put things in context and to, to begin, what period is Josephus writing? So um, Josephus is a Flavian author. Now, the Flavian dynasty were Rome's second imperial dynasty after the Julio-Claudians, uh, and they were in power from 69 to 96 AD. And of the four works of Josephus that we have, uh, the first three are all very precisely datable, and they all fall within this time period. So he's writing in Rome under the Flavian emperors. Um, his final work we can't date precisely, and some people think that that might be sort of nudging us into the early years of the second second century, uh, but for the most part he's writing in the last three decades of the first century. Okay, and do we have any biographical information on Josephus, or is he like most sort of ancient authors where we have only little bits? We've, we've actually got a ton of biographical oh, information wow. on Josephus. There is uh, one very important caveat to this, though, and that's that almost everything we know about Josephus comes from Josephus. <laughs> There's going to be a certain amount of perhaps spin of self-positioning here, uh, and certain aspects of his life story are treated with a bit of suspicion by some modern scholars. But the story as he tells it is really, really interesting. He tells us he was born in 37 AD. He was a member of the ruling class of Roman Judea. Um, he was a, a priest at the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and a landowner and of royal descent. So a very uh, senior member of his society. His life starts to get really interesting in the year 66. And what happens in 66 is uh, we get a major provincial revolt breaking out in Judea against Roman rule. And in its early stages, it's a very successful revolt. The rebels succeed in uh, driving the Roman governor out of Judea, uh, in essentially sort of dismantling the apparatus of provincial government in that part of the world. We don't know exactly what Josephus is doing in those early months. He doesn't tell us, which is maybe a little bit suspicious. Um, but when he does re-emerge, it's in October 66. He's on the rebel side, and he's actually a rebel general fighting against the Romans. He's in command of the Jewish forces in Galilee fighting against a Roman army led by a very experienced senator whose name is Vespasian. And he tells us lots and lots about his time as commander in Galilee. Uh, he goes around trying to raise an army. He fortifies all these various uh, hilltop strongholds that the rebels can use as bases. But by the summer of 67, the Roman army under Vespasian has succeeded in trapping him in the rebel stronghold of Jota Pata, which is modern day Yodfat in Galilee. Uh, and you can actually still go to the site today. You can see the remains of uh, the, the, the town from that period, lots of evidence of the Roman destruction. You can even look at the walls of the city, which Josephus tells us that he helped build and strengthen and fortify ahead of the Roman attack. After a 47-day siege, the Romans storm Jotapata, uh, and they capture Josephus and make him a prisoner of war. Um, and what then happens in the next couple of years is he is somehow able to defect in captivity. He goes from being a prisoner of war to being a Roman ally and to helping um, the Romans uh, fight against the Jewish rebels. And the story that he tells about his defection is really, really interesting. And it's one part of his life story that many people are very skeptical about. He claims that he had essentially prophetic gifts and that all through the siege of Jotapata, he was receiving prophetic dreams from God, which told him that the Jewish revolt was going to fail. Uh, and which also told him crucially that this Roman general Vespasian was very soon going to become emperor. So when he was captured after this siege, he had a personal interview with Vespasian and he delivered this prophecy to Vespasian and told him he was soon going to, uh, going to become emperor. Nobody believed him at the time, so says Josephus. But within a couple of years, incredibly, his prophecy had come true. Uh, the emperor Nero died in 68. This led to a major civil war in the Roman world. Uh, the year 69 is called the year of the four emperors because four different people managed to get themselves set up as emperor in that time. Um, and during all this chaos, Vespasian actually decided to launch a bid for the throne from his Judean command, uh, which was ultimately successful. 
So in 70, uh, Vespasian is about to return to Rome to become emperor when he remembers his highborn Jewish prisoner and this amazing prophecy that he'd given back in 67. And he actually sets Josephus free, gives him Roman citizenship. And Josephus then spends the rest of the war um, with the Roman army. The war against the Jews is still going on while all this chaos is happening. Uh, he spends the rest of the war with the Roman army, helping the new general Titus, who is the eldest son of Vespasian, and who would himself go on to become emperor after his father dies, helping Titus lay siege to Jerusalem. Uh, Josephus acts as an interpreter, as a negotiator, as an interrogator of prisoners uh, working with the Romans. And ultimately, after the war, when Jerusalem is destroyed, the Jerusalem temple is destroyed, which is where Josephus had, had sort of worked before the revolt. After the war is successfully completed from the Roman perspective, Josephus is brought back to Rome as an honored sort of guest of the new dynasty. Uh, he's given a house. Uh, he's given money. He's given some land to uh, bring him uh, an income. Uh, and he spends the rest of his life living in Rome, writing books in Greek for Greek and Roman readers about about Jewish things. So that's a, it's a pretty incredible life story, actually, but that's, that's his story as he tells it, and that's how he wants to be understood by his readers. So excellent. So there's a lot there. Now, when we, we, we look at all, we have obviously all this, but how much of what he wrote survives? I mean, in total, or do we have the lot? Uh, we don't quite have the lot, no. Um, what we do have is we've got four works. The first of those four works was written, um, most of it anyway, was written late in the reign of Vespasian uh, around the period 75 to 79. Um, and it's a very detailed war monograph. It's a description of this recent Jewish revolt in which Josephus and the new emperors uh, had played such an important role, um, written sort of in the style of Thucydides. Um, and giving lots and lots of information about uh, Josephus' own part in proceedings. His next two works both are both completed in the year 94 uh, in the reign of Vespasian's younger son, Domitian, the last of the Flavian emperors. Uh, so his second work, The Jewish Antiquities, is a, a hugely ambitious work in scope. Uh, it's a total history of the Jewish people from their origins down to Josephus' own lifetime uh, in 20 books. And his third work was originally written as a sort of appendix to this, this work, The Jewish Antiquities. It's called The Vita, My Life. Um, and it's, it, it's a sort of autobiography of Josephus. Um, what seems to have happened is after the Jewish war was published, Josephus came in for a lot of criticism in the works of various Greek and Roman writers. Uh, and so he writes uh, The Vita in order to counter this criticism, to give his side of the story and to rebut what these other people were writing about him. His fourth and final work was uh, The Against Appian. It's a work of sort of religious apologetics. It's a defense of the Jewish people. Uh, in particular, it's a defense of the Jewish people against some very mean things that certain Greek writers had been writing about them. And it also includes a sort of idealized summary of the Jewish law, uh, which he tries to present as the greatest constitution in human history it, 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 in passages which make it very clear that he's been reading his Greek constitutional theory. He defines Judaism as a political constitution and tries to show that it's better than all the other political constitutions. So those are the four works that we have that survive. We only know of one other work that he wrote, which really, really tragically doesn't survive. He tells us that before he wrote The Jewish War in Greek, he wrote another account of the Jewish revolt. But this account was written in Aramaic and was specifically written for a non-Greek and Roman readership and probably mostly a Jewish readership. It's a real shame we don't have that. It'd be very interesting to look at the differences between how he tells this story to non-Romans and how he tells this story to Romans in particular. And do you think there's a chance, I mean, Aramaic, it was only discovered kind of recently, wasn't it? They found a, a library of it somewhere? Or am I mixing that up with a different language? Um, I, I think we've known how to read Aramaic for quite a long time. Okay. Uh, Aramaic was, it, it was one of the old official languages of the Achaemenid yeah. Persian Empire. It was quite widely oh, spoken yeah, sorry, in the Roman I'm, East. I'm, I'm mixing it up with somewhere else. Never mind. Do you think there's a chance that that's still out there? It's still buried <laughs> somewhere? Or do you think it really is gone? It, we'd be extraordinarily lucky if we found, found it. Uh, we can't really hold out any hope I don't think okay. sadly it's, it's, it's such a shame it's yeah. such a shame but yeah um, and uh, moving on back uh, back to his work sorry we mm -hmm. a little digression there does his work 
follow a similar tradition to other Roman writers and historians, or is his angle totally unique? It's both familiar and unique, which might sound like a strange kind of answer. It's familiar to people who read classical literature because in addition to his extensive Jewish education, Josephus clearly has some measure of paideia, of Greek learning, and he tries really hard to make his works comprehensible and attractive to his Greek and Roman readers. So he deploys all of the sort of rhetorical tricks and techniques that a good Greek author is supposed to deploy. He's clearly read in the Greek canon. He's capable of quoting or alluding to authors like Thucydides, like Polybius, uh, a good number of other Greek and Roman authors. Um, So aspects of what he writes is familiar. Uh, uh, Aspects of what he writes recalls the classical tradition of Greco-Roman literature. But on the other hand, um, he's also we might say biblically literate. He's also a part of the Jewish canon, the Jewish tradition of literature, and in particular he has a very theocentric vision of history. For instance, his understanding of the Jewish revolt is that the destruction of Jerusalem was a punishment of God on his people because of the sins of the Jewish rebels. God actually abandoned the Jews and went over and sided with the Romans and punished his people by having the Romans destroy the temple. This, I think, would be pretty astonishing uh, to Romans. Roman readers, this isn't really how they're used to thinking about history, but it's very familiar from the Hebrew Bible. If you read the historical books of the Hebrew Bible, like First and Second Kings, particularly uh, material that pertains to the destruction of, Bab- of, of uh, Jerusalem by the Babylonians in the late 6th century BC, uh, this is exactly how those biblical authors understand uh, events taking place. So uh, there's an element of uh, the Jewish tradition in there, there's an element of the Greco-Roman tradition in there, it's all sort of blended together into this really interesting sort of mixture and uh, if we can step back from specifically Josephus for just one second uh, it's worth noticing that this seems to be something that's really common in situations of colonialism situations of imperialism much more broadly Uh, what you end up with is uh, an educated sort of local or quote-unquote native class uh, who are steeped in their own culture but who also learn and master the culture of the conquerors Uh, and that sort of hybridity is something that uh, Josephus is a really, really good example of from the Roman Empire. Mm. And consider you, you mentioned there the idea that he's he's kind of he, he's coming from this educated native class, almost if that's the term we want to do it. So his his Jewish background, because of this, do his histories bear any anti-Roman sentiments, or is it all pretty clean and pro-Roman? It's it's complicated, uh, as, as, as a question like that suggests it would be. It, what's very interesting about the way he depicts uh, Roman rule in Judea is it's not a sanitised account, and he is not afraid to point up instances when the Roman government of the Jews was oppressive, was offensive, was tyrannical. You get a long string of, of Roman governors from AD 6 down to 66, and many of them, are, as presented by Josephus, are terrible people. They take bribes, they uh, massacre people, they uh, persecute, uh, they they loot from the temple in some cases. He's not afraid to show that Roman rule is often characterised by brutality, uh, particularly because of its agents on the ground. He's also not above criticising emperors, in particular the emperor Caligula. There was a very uh, difficult episode where it it seems Caligula tried to have a statue of himself set up in the Jerusalem temple, uh, which is tremendously offensive (laughs) to many Jewish people's religious sense sensitivities at the time. Uh, And Josephus, of course, castigates and vilifies Caligula for doing this. So he's not afraid to admit that Roman rule can be harsh, can be brutal, can be oppressive, but it's all within a broadly functioning system. The problems with Roman government, as Josephus presents it, uh, are not systemic. They're all to do with individual bad apples. And actually what Josephus is keen to emphasize is that when the Jewish people really do have grievances, when they are oppressed, when they are um, tyrannized, there are avenues of address, of redress, which are open to them. They can go and complain to the governor of Syria. Uh, they can go and complain to the emperor. And usually when that happens, the system will correct itself. So I think from a Roman point of view, this is quite a reassuring uh, sketch of Roman power because it shows that although individual Romans can be guilty of maladministration and terrible conduct, the system is not at fault. Uh, the system basically works. And when the system really does break down, in 66 uh, and everything falls apart and you get this this insurrection it's 
probably fair to say that on Josephus's reading, that's mostly the fault of irrational, unreasonable, extremist Jewish rebels uh, who cannot compromise and behave reasonably. He, he absolutely despises the yeah. extremer elements in the in the Jewish rebel movement. So his view is more so Roman individuals can be bad, but overall. Roman rule is a good thing. Would that um, be fair to say? Or is that too general? Roman rule is a good thing. I, th- I, th- I think uh, Roman rule is not in itself oppressive. Um, one thing that people have noticed about Josephus is he's got very little to say about the benefits of Roman rule in the sense that he, he doesn't present the Romans as, in any sense, civilizers or as people who raise the level of, uh, of the people uh, whose lands they colonized. I think what Josephus is emphasizing is that there is no necessary incompatibility between Judaism and Roman rule. The Roman system of government is capable of tolerating Jews, of creating a place for them without there necessarily being any sort of friction um, between subjects and rulers. Yeah. And the other kind of thing I want to address, you talked about Caligula there, who's obviously a... uh quite a kind of a controversial figure in, in total. Suetonius obviously says quite some some fantastical things about him. Mm. But in terms of the Flavian dynasty, which is kind of the who he's writing under, are the conquerors of Judea, such as Titus, are they depicted in a positive or negative light? Um, I, I'd say broadly positive. Um, the thing to bear in mind here is that just writing about Roman power is potentially problematic for Josephus. Uh, he's not afraid to admit, he makes it very clear that at one stage of his life he was an anti-Roman dissident. So he's got to be a little bit careful when he writes about Roman power, uh, not to make it seem like any of that dissidence is still lingering on. But then there's a whole set of additional and very specific constraints when he's writing about the Flavian dynasty. He really owes these people. He owes them his life. Uh, when he was captured at Josipata, Vespasian could have executed him as a rebel commander, and he didn't. Uh, subsequently, the Flavians gave him citizenship. They gave him all this support when he got back to Rome. Um, he's essentially a client of the Flavian house, and you can't really be disrespectful to your clients in Roman culture. So he's got to be broadly positive, I think, uh, in the way that he depicts Vespasian and Titus, um, or at the least he can't be obviously disrespectful. But having said all that, what you don't get from Josephus in the Jewish war is panegyric. He's not afraid to admit that there, there are shortcomings in both Vespasian and Titus. They're clearly distinct characters. They're quite believable personalities. And they, they're not infallible. They get things wrong sometimes. Vespasian is presented, I think, as a very competent, very seasoned uh, military commander. He's quite a brave man, as he shows when he has to uh, enter combat personally at the siege of Gamala in the Golan Heights. Josephus praises his his sunesis, his his quick military thinking and planning. So a very, very sort of competent and good commander. Uh, Titus is also very competent, but he's a very different sort of character. He's much more dynamic, much more charismatic and glamorous. He's really a sort of dashing warrior prince. He's always really eager to charge into battle personally. Uh, When he does so, Josephus always presents his interventions as being decisive. The whole legion would have been wiped out had not Titus ridden to the rescue, that sort of thing. He's also incredibly gentle and merciful. He really doesn't like punishing people, even when they really deserve it. He's got a a, a good heart. So um, quite a different figure from his father. Um, Both, I think, broadly positively sketched. There are some readers who've seen problems with these characters. Uh, In particular, some of the things that Vespasian does can strike readers as being cruel, even by the standards of ancient warfare, perhaps. He's also a little bit duplicitous. He keeps breaking his word, or at least on a couple of occasions, he says he's going to do something, he then does something else. And that's not such a great character trait, perhaps. On the other hand, Titus... At times he can be reckless, he can expose himself and his troops to danger without taking proper precautions. Also, sometimes his gentleness, his mercy comes across as gullibility. He keeps getting tricked by the enemy. He keeps being unable to see through their schemes because he's got such a simple, gentle soul. Um, So there are aspects of the portraits of the Flavians in Josephus which can seem critical, which can seem to expose their limits. Um, My own view is that I think these are positive portraits, entirely as you'd expect from a writer writing under the sorts of constraints that Josephus is writing, Um, but they're not infallible. He's happy to admit that they get it wrong sometimes. Um, Ultimately, what he creates are, I think, believable 
easily differentiatable portraits of these two uh, individuals. Uh, and I think most writers, inc most readers, including most ancient readers, would see these sketches as being very uh, complementary to both Vespasian and Titus. You used the word when you were talking about um, how he wrote as he, he had certain constraints. Does that mean that there was someone looking over his shoulder saying, oh, maybe you shouldn't include that because that's a bit too negative? <laughs> or do you think it was more just his own conviction saying, I owe these people so I'm going to ignore this and make them seem a little nicer. I, I, I suspect uh, it's more likely to be the latter. I don't think that's sort of, that there's not actually that much evidence for that kind of proactive, preventive censorship in Roman society, I don't think. Uh, there was no Bureau of Censorship or Ministry of Truth in Flavian Rome. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I think certainly um, it, it's very clear that if you do upset the emperor in writing under certain conditions you can pay a pretty severe price for doing that including under the Flavians actually they were known to take action against uh, writers who uh, displeased them in various ways I think he just has to be a little bit careful and it's probably going to be more to do with kind of self-censorship with his own desire to create a portrait uh, that the Flavians uh, will find appealing uh, the one thing that he does tell us in his autobiography is that when he was writing the Jewish war. He used to send drafts to this character, uh, King Agrippa II, who was the Roman client king of Judea, and who'd always stayed very loyal uh, to the Romans all through the revolt. They apparently exchanged correspondences, which included Josephus sending Agrippa drafts of what he was writing and asking him for information. So possibly Agrippa might have been able to exercise some kind of influence on the finished product and to steer him away from certain types of negative representation. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, I think it's mostly going to be self-censorship and a desire, an innate desire to try and sort of please the Flavians to whom he owed so much. Now, this is a slightly loaded question, so you might want to break it down into a few sections. But what exactly does De Bello Judaico cover? Uh, and how long was the Roman War in Judea? Um, well, the Jewish War begins in a really surprising place, uh, considering it's supposed to uh, be, be a close study of this revolt, uh, which broke out in 66. Uh, he begins in the 160s BC, in the Hellenistic period. Uh, the first two books of the Jewish War really provide the deep background to the Jewish revolt. So he gives us a quick history of the Jews under first Hellenistic and then Roman rule, um, beginning with another revolt in the 160s, uh, the Maccabean revolt, uh, when the Jews tried to drive out uh, the, the Seleucids, uh, uh, a successor kingdom of Alexander from Judea, and actually succeeded in creating their own uh, independent state and independent monarchy. He goes down to, um, you get a brief history of this dynasty, the Hasmonean Jewish dynasty. And then in 63, we get really the, uh, 63 BC, sorry, uh, we get really the first direct intervention of Rome in Jewish affairs when Pompey the great is in the region and he, he puts a new king on the throne essentially a king who is bound to Rome as a sort of client king figure we then get a long account of the rise of uh, the wicked and notorious King Herod the Great who was a sort of chancer and strong man who managed to win the support of Mark Antony and get himself appointed king of Judea we get a long account of his reign which it appears was a period of great terror he ruled mainly through fear he had a very complicated private life which involved him murdering lots of his own sons and uh, things like that. It's a very, very colourful, uh, tragic, dramatic account of the reign of Herod. That then leads into the period of direct Roman uh, provincial government uh, when Judea was ruled by equestrian rank uh, Roman governors from 6 AD down to 66 when the revolt breaks out. Uh, as I've already mentioned, quite a troubled period. Lots of these governors weren't particularly pleasant. Uh, they did lots of unpleasant things. You get a sort of gradual rise of the tension until uh, the revolt breaks out in 66. Roman government is uh, dismantled by the Jewish rebels. The, the first Roman attempt to reconquer Judea uh, under the governor of Syria actually fails. The Roman army is compelled to withdraw from Jerusalem. They then get pretty badly massacred in a valley north of Jerusalem. And that takes you down really to the end of book two. Books three and four describe Vespasian's campaigns against the Jewish rebels uh, in the north of the country in Galilee from uh, 67 down to 69. And uh, much of that is taken up, uh, much of book three anyway, is taken up with a description of Josephus's own activities as general in that region, an account of the siege of Jotapata when he comes into Roman hands. And then at the end of book four, 
you get an account of the Roman civil wars, a brief account of the Roman civil wars, which led to Vespasian becoming emperor, um, which is really potentially dangerous subject matter for Josephus to be tackling, but he does. Books five and six describe the campaigns of Titus after Vespasian has gone off uh, to become emperor. Uh, Titus takes over command of the army fighting the Jews. And you get a very long, very detailed, pretty horrific, actually, account of uh, this very long, very bloody siege of Jerusalem. All through books one to six, you get this progressive intensification of focus, a progressive darkening of tone. Uh, and by the end of book six, it's pretty much an unremitting litany of horrors and atrocities. Uh, it reaches its peak when a Jewish woman called Maria of Beth Zuba is driven by hunger during the siege of Jerusalem to kill, cook and eat her own baby son. That's uh, indicative of the, the tone of the, the later books of the account of the war. Book six ends with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Uh, you then get the final book, book seven, uh, which describes the consequences of the Jewish revolt. Uh, the first portion of it is really concerned with the establishment of the Flavian dynasty. Uh, it gives us a very famous account of the triumphal procession, which the Flavians celebrated in Rome over the Jews in the year 71. And then the second half of book seven describes, if you like, mopping up operations in the region, that the last few bastions of Jewish resistance that's still need to be reduced. Uh, and it culminates really in uh, an account of uh, the Siege of Masada, which is a very famous episode. 980 Jewish rebel defenders in this phenomenal desert fortress, which again, you can still go and visit today. It's an incredible place. Uh, they commit, on Josephus' account, they commit collective suicide rather than fall prisoner to the Romans. Uh, again, a very highly dramatic account. Um, and so that's really the, the, the scope of the Jewish war. It goes from the 160s BC uh, down to 73 or 74, um, but its real focus is on these years 66 to 70 with the Roman campaigns in Judea against uh, the Jewish rebels. Okay. Uh, so obviously that, that very, very broad, very long narrative mm -hmm. that he gives us. But my quest, my next question is, is Josephus's or Josephus's work the only source in the matter or do we have someone that we can compare him with or is? Well, uh, I mean, there, there are, we've got some non-literary sources. There's some phenomenal archaeology in Israel. Uh, many sites in Israel show evidence of destruction dating to this period. I've already mentioned Yod Fat. I've mentioned Masada. Even in Jerusalem, it's possible to go and visit the houses of the Jerusalem elite from the time, which show quite clear signs of having been destroyed in the year 70, presumably at the period of, uh, of the revolt. Um, we also have some good numismatic sources. The Flavians minted lots of coins celebrating the suppression of the revolt. Just as interestingly, the Jewish rebels also minted their own coinage, which shows usually iconography associated with the temple cult, with legends written in archaic Hebrew script. This maybe tells us something about the kind of society that these rebels uh, were trying to create in the brief period of independence. In terms of literary sources, we don't have very much, actually. We've got a few passing remarks in Suetonius's biographies of Vespasian and Titus, but no uh, connected full narrative account. We've got an abbreviated account in the works of Cassius Dio. Actually, we don't have Dio's own words for this period, but we do have some abbreviated summaries, some epitomes of Dio's work, uh, which cover the war against the Jews. So we, we learn a little bit of information from that. What's incredibly frustrating is we don't have Tacitus' account of the destruction of Jerusalem. We know he wrote one because we have the beginning of the fifth book of Tacitus' histories, in which he tells us he's going to give us a detailed account of the fall of the famous city of Jerusalem, but our manuscript breaks off before he gets that far. And that's an incredibly frustrating gap. If you're like me and you're interested in this period, I think it would be endlessly fascinating to have Tacitus' take on the fall of Jerusalem. Frustratingly, that's, uh, that doesn't survive. Other than that, we've got some late traditions, uh, particularly in later Jewish literature, in rabbinic literature, for instance. Uh, if you look, for instance, in the Babylonian Talmud, in uh, Tractate Gittin, uh, you find a whole fantastic collection of sort of folk stories about the fall of Jerusalem. It, it's really interesting to compare the rabbinic version of Titus with Josephus's version of Titus. To Josephus, Titus is this heroic warrior prince. To the rabbis, he's a terrible sinner. And in this Tractate Gittin, we have this amazing story that 
for no reason other than to be outrageous, Titus took a prostitute into the Holy of Holies, which is the most sacred part of the Jerusalem temple that you're really not supposed to go into. Uh, he had sex with this prostitute on top of a Torah scroll. Uh, he then took his sword and hacked through the curtain, which separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple, and blood came out of the temple where he cut it. And then a little bit later, Titus taunts God for not being able to stop him destroying the temple. And so God punishes him by sending a gnat to do battle with Titus. And the gnat goes up Titus's nose into his brain and spends tortures him for the rest of his life with noise and pain and eventually kills him. And when they sort of dig the gnat out of Titus's brain after he's died, they find that it's grown to the size of a sparrow in his head. So really incredible sort of folk tales about the fall of Jerusalem. It might be misleading to call these sources because I don't think there's much in them that's of assistance in helping us reconstruct what happens in 70. But it's interesting to read them nonetheless and to see how later generations of Jews told these stories to help them make sense of the fall of the temple in 70, I guess. Now, his second major work is is entitled uh, Jewish Antiquities, and it discusses the history of the Jewish people. What does it tell us about how the Jews in the Roman world perceive themselves? I suppose I should rephrase that and say, what does it tell us about how a Jew in the Roman world perceived? I I think that's right. It's it's always dangerous. Josephus is such a a unique character that it might be dangerous to try and extrapolate his perspectives uh, to any Jewish person apart from himself. It's uh, it, it's a very interesting work, The Antiquities, and what it shows us is how a Jewish person who is learned in both Jewish history and culture and Greco-Roman history and culture decided to represent his people to Greeks and Romans, to the out- outer world. And uh, what we find in it is much of the Jewish Antiquities is actually a rewrite of the narrative portions of the Hebrew Bible. A a little over a half of it is essentially a Hellenizing rewrite of the Bible. And it's really interesting to look at how he changes the Bible and what steps he takes to make these stories more palatable to a Greek and Roman readership. He keeps telling us that he's giving us a straight translation. He's not adding or taking anything away from the Bible. That's just a lie. He's adding and taking things away from the Bible, changing things all the time. For instance, there's some really interesting material in the second book of the Jewish Antiquities about the life of Moses. He adds in a whole load of extra biblical traditions in according to which Moses served as a general in Pharaoh's army as a young man and uh, led a war against the Ethiopians. Uh, And it very much presents Moses as a sort of charismatic uh, military leader, almost in the mold of Alexander the Great. And wherever Josephus is getting these stories from, he clearly recognises that these stories are going to make Moses a more attractive figure to Greeks and Romans because they like their heroes to have military competence and to have fighting experience. Uh, So he adds in all these stories that you don't find in, in the book of Exodus. Another example is a little bit earlier in Antiquities 2. He tells the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife from Genesis 36, I think. It's a Bible story. Uh, Joseph has become the slave of a prominent Egyptian called Potiphar. Potiphar's wife falls in love with Joseph, keeps trying to seduce him. Joseph keeps rejecting her. So she becomes angry, falsely accuses Joseph of trying to rape her. And Joseph then ends up in Pharaoh's dungeon because of this. Uh, Now, when Josephus looks at this story, he clearly sees promise there. And in particular, he sees parallels between this story and the Greek story of Phydra, which is a really, really similar story, a very important story in uh, the tragic canon. It's told most famously in Euripides' Hippolytus. So when Josephus tells this story, he writes it up almost like a Greek tragedy. He gives big speeches to both Joseph and to Potiphar's wife. He takes a really psychologizing approach to it in the way that Greek tragedy would do, but in the way that Genesis doesn't. He really rewrites it as the kind of narrative that he thinks his Greek and Roman readers are going to appreciate and enjoy. So he's trying to make Judaism comprehensible to Greeks and Romans. In the later books, when he's dealing with post-biblical stuff, one thing that he likes to do is he likes to take famous people from Greek and Roman history and tell stories about their relationship to the Jews. And in particular, he likes to show them as great admirers of the Jews. So in book 11, he tells a story about how Alexander the Great went to Jerusalem. No other source says this. None of none of the Greek or Roman Alexander historians has Alexander going to Jerusalem, but Josephus does. And he has this fantastic story about how when... Uh, assumably, though, I mean, sorry, this is a bit of a digression, right. but uh, assumably 
Alexander probably did pass through that region because he did go um, from, from the east down to <laughs> Siwa is the, the famous story. So perhaps it is true or do you think that that's actually just Joseph's making it up? There might be some truth. The problem is if you want to go from uh, sort of Syria, Phoenicia or Asia Minor down into Egypt, it makes much more sense to follow the coastal roads than to go inland. And Jerusalem is inland, it's mm. not on the coastal mm. roads. So it seems most likely that probably Alexander would have uh, would have followed that coastal road. And indeed, that's, that's the itinerary that's usually yeah. given in the other writers. So I'd, it's probably safe to say he didn't go to Jerusalem, yeah. I suspect. But Josephus gives this really interesting story. He goes to Jerusalem, he sees the high priest at the temple, and he's overawed by admiration for him. So he falls on his face and uh, gives him honour. And then the high priest shows Alexander how his own career, how his military achievements uh, are predicted in the book of Daniel in the Bible. So it's this fantastic story about this real big hitter from Greco-Roman history that everybody knows being a, a great admirer, a great enthusiast for the Jews and for Judaism. He also emphasizes Jewish rights under Hellenistic kings and Roman generals and emperors. He keeps referring to all the various sort of exemptions uh, that Jews have been offered by these figures. It's his way of showing that Jews have a history of uh, integrating and and playing a part in the broader Greco-Roman world. So I think what you get in the Antiquities is a book which is anxious to recast Jewish biblical history in Greco-Roman terms to make it more comprehensible to outsiders, um, which is keen to emphasize that Jews have played a role in Greco-Roman history as well and can find a place in this sort of broader Greco-Roman world. I think those are really the the sort of main anxieties, the main motivations behind the Antiquities uh, and its presentation of Judaism and the Jewish people. Okay. And then I suppose in the broader sort of historical canon surrounding it, Josephus is obviously the main source, but from what other evidence we have, how or what do we know about how the Jewish people were treated under the Roman imperial rule? Well, Roman treatment of Jews is, is in fact one of the major themes of a couple of Josephus' works. We also have another major Jewish author from the first century, Philo of Alexandria. He was a Jewish philosopher. He was writing under the reign of, uh, mostly under the reign of Claudius, so sort of a generation or so before Josephus was writing. They present broadly similar pictures of the situation, and the situation seems to be that Jews had certain rights, certain concessions, certain exemptions, which enabled them to function within the Greco-Roman world and did not require them to break their ancestral laws, their patrioi nomoi, as Josephus calls them. Josephus particularly likes to attribute these sorts of deals, these exemptions, these concessions to Julius Caesar and to Augustus. And we learn, for instance, that uh, Jewish people were not to be conscripted into the Roman army. There was an exemption of Jews serving in the Roman army, which is very sensible because being a Roman soldier was quite a ritualized existence. There's a lot of ceremonial you have to go through, which might be problematic for Jewish people. So that's an exemption that makes sense. We also learn that the Romans allowed the Jews to gather in Jerusalem for the three great pilgrim festivals, which were huge events, quite often troubled events as well, often focuses for popular dissent. Josephus tells us that uh, at these three annual pilgrimage festivals, the size of the population of Jerusalem would triple sometimes. And the Romans were often a little bit anxious about mass gatherings like this, but they did allow the Jews to keep doing it so that they could fulfill their ancestral customs. Perhaps the best example is to look at imperial cult. Imperial cult is clearly something that would be difficult for Jewish people in any of its main manifestations. Jewish people cannot worship the living emperor. They cannot worship the living emperor's deceased predecessors. They cannot worship divine beings who are associated with the emperor, like the Genius Augusti. And Josephus claims that the Augustan compromise on imperial uh, cults was that the priests at the Temple of Jerusalem, in their role as representatives of the whole ethnos of the Jewish people would every day make sacrifices to the Jewish God on behalf of the emperor. And that's, again, quite a sensible compromise. It allows the Jews to show their loyalty, their enthusiasm for the imperial family without having to break any of uh, the customary laws of, of, of Jewish life. And so this is the sort of balance that's often struck, sensible compromises which enable the Jews to continue living under their ancestral laws while playing a part in broader culture. And Josephus particularly, and also Philo, emphasizes that whenever anybody breaks uh, these compromises, whether it's 
Romans like Caligula trying to get a statue set up in the temple. That's that that's Caligula requiring something that his predecessors hadn't insisted on. Or whether it's the Jews who break their side of the bargain, like in 66, when radical priests take control of the temple and stop offering sacrifices on behalf of the emperor. Anytime either side breaks these sorts of these sorts of concessions, uh, you end up with trouble um, and everything starts to fall apart. So Josephus is a big believer, it seems, in in the status quo and in honouring these sorts of arrangements that were put in place by Julius Caesar, by Augustus, by the Hellenistic kings in, in terms of Jewish rights and privileges. OK, and then coming towards the end, do we have any information about the later life of Josephus and his death? A little, not not as much as we'd like. He's not very, he, he doesn't talk much about his life in Rome, particularly. We know that he was married three times. Uh, we know that he had multiple children. We know the names of three of his sons. We know that for a while, at least during the reigns of Vespasian and Titus, he maintained his links with the imperial family. We hear about all these various grants and concessions that were given to him by Vespasian and Titus. Much less about Vespasian's younger son, Domitian, who took over, became emperor in 81 after the death of Titus. Domitian, of course, hadn't been involved in the suppression of the Jewish revolt, so he's got much less of a personal connection to Josephus than either Vespasian and Titus. And some people think that maybe uh, Josephus somewhat drifts out of the imperial orbit in the reign of Domitian. We learn, for instance, that his literary patron in his later works was not a member of the imperial family, but a wealthy freed slave called Epaphroditus. Uh, so perhaps a slight change in his circumstances indicated there. In terms of his early works, Vespasian and Titus were very enthusiastic about them. He tells us that Titus uh, expressed the wish that anybody who wanted to learn about the Jewish revolt would learn about it from Josephus's book and from nobody else's book, because Josephus's book is, is the right one, it's the good one. Josephus also tells us that Titus signed a copy of uh, the Jewish war with his own hand, whatever that means, uh, and that he arranged for the further publication of this work so that copies of it could circulate. And some later Christian writers, Eusebius and Jerome, tell us that Titus was such a fan of uh, Josephus that Josephus actually had a statue put up in a public place in Rome uh, and the copy of the Jewish war was deposited in one of the public imperial libraries by Titus. So seems very much, if these stories are true, they might not be, but seems very much like uh, the Jewish war was something like the official version of the suppression of the revolt in Judea. In terms of what else we know about him, he seems to have had a lot of enemies in Rome. He talks about being criticised often, and sometimes his enemies would apparently prosecute him. He's very vague on the details. We only know about a couple of charges. Uh, he tells us that he was accused of something or other by one of his son's tutors. And he tells us that in apparently a separate case, he was actually accused of supplying money and weapons to Jewish anti-Roman dissidents in the North African city of Cyrene. Uh, so that perhaps suggests that in some Roman quarters there was maybe a bit of lingering doubt about his loyalty to Rome. But he's also keen to emphasise that the emperors always protected him from the malicious accusations of his enemies. They always made sure that no harm came to him because of these prosecutions. That's more or less it. We don't really know when he died or how he died or where he died. We don't know if he ever traveled, if he ever went back to Judea or if he just stayed in Rome for the rest of his life. Um, really, after the publication of his last work against Appian, everything is uh, everything is silence. And that's as far as we can take his story. Okay. And to sum it all up at the end, if I could leave today's podcast with only three points on Josephus and his work, and I suppose the Jews in the broader historical context, what would you like them to be? Ooh, good question. I think uh, the first point would be, if you're interested in Roman history, and presumably if you're listening to this podcast, you are, <laughs> do, do consider reading him. I say that because he often doesn't get read by people with classical interests. And I think that's partly because we think of Josephus as the Jewish historian, and we maybe wonder if he belongs in the canon of Greek and Roman literature in a sense. I think he emphatically does. I mean, he's writing in Greek. He's writing, among other things, a Thucydidean war monograph on important events in Roman history. He is himself a Roman 
Roman. Um, if you enjoy reading classical authors like classical historians like Tacitus, Polybius, Thucydides, you will find a lot that you recognize in the works of Josephus. So do give him a go. And I would say that now is a really good time to discover the joys of the Jewish war uh, because there's a brand new translation just come out by the great Martin Hammond uh, with really useful notes and introduction by Martin Goodman, one of our leading scholars uh, on this period. So now's a really good chance to discover the Jewish war. Second point is, if you do read him, try not to judge him too harshly. Um, he's had a really bad reputation for a long time. A lot of readers in the 19th and the early to mid 20th century can't get past the fact that he's a traitor. He switched sides in a war. He betrayed his own people to save his own skin. A lot of readers of Josephus historically have concluded that this means that he is pretty much a worthless individual, that nothing he writes can be reliable, uh, that he's only interested in self-preservation and in flattering the Roman emperors. I think that's harsh. I think he was in very difficult position in 67. I can't say for certain that I wouldn't do the same. Um, and if you really can't withhold your scorn from this terrible man, then also bear in mind that in one really important sense, he did always remain loyal to the Jewish people. Uh, all through his literary career, he advocated for them, perhaps at a time when Jewish people were not massively popular because of the recent revolt. Uh, he's always advocating for them uh, to his Greek and Roman readers. And I think that consistent advocacy should probably get him, uh, consistent advocacy for perhaps an unpopular minority should perhaps get him a bit of credit in our eyes as well. Um, and the final point is, I think this, this is going to sound like quite a strange thing to say because he's got such a unique life story. You might be tempted to conclude that nothing he says can illuminate anything apart from his own life. But actually, I think in some really important ways, he reflects and illuminates very widespread issues in the Roman world. He is not the only person who has to balance a multifaceted hybrid identity in this period. He's a bit Roman because he's a Roman citizen. He's a bit Greek because he writes in Greek and presents himself as a sort of a Greek scholar. Uh, he's a bit Jewish because of his roots, because of his expertise in that culture. Many, many people in the Roman world had to mix up identities in that kind of way. In a period when Greek learning is spreading very widely, in a period when Roman citizenship is increasingly spreading across the empire, um, these sorts of hybrid, multifaceted identities are really common. And reading the works of Josephus can give us some insights, I think, into ways in which lots of people in the Roman world might have managed their hybridity, their cultural code switching in this fantastically mixed and multicultural Roman world. Brilliant. And that brings us very nicely to the end of the podcast. John, thank you so much for joining me today. I really enjoyed it. Real pleasure. Thank you. Um, and if you at home enjoyed today's podcast and want to find out more about the work we do at Classical Youth Society of Ireland, get in touch via our social media outlets, www.facebook.com forward slash Classical Youth Society of Ireland. You could follow us on Twitter at CYSI underscore. For any direct inquiries, you can email us cysiofficial at gmail.com. This particular series of Conversing the Classics was made possible due to the kind help of the Classical Association of Ireland, with today's episode being edited by Michael Fuller. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll catch you all next time.